afternoon, everyone. Uh, join us for Coffee with the Codex. Um, as you can see, Doc Porter, our usual host, is uh, not with us today. Uh, she's actually here in, in the background, but she's she's not uh, joining us for uh, for this session. Um, my name is Nicholas Herman. I'm the curator of manuscripts at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, and I'm really pleased to uh, be here with two colleagues from Penn, uh, Whitney Trittine and Paul Carbonell, who are going to help present this amazing object today. So, um, Whitney, do you want to say a few words, introduce yourself, and Paul, you, you, you also? Sure. Um, welcome. My name is Whitney. I'm here uh, to look at this beautiful book with you. I'm, at a, uh, I'm an assistant professor in the English department working in book history and digital humanities, and I'm excited to share a little bit about what we've been learning about this remarkable volume. Hi, I'm Paul Cardinal. I'm a PhD candidate in the French department and I'm working with Whitney on this book, helping her um, with French translations uh, and kind of historical uh, background for, for the book. Yeah, great. We can dive right in. Um, Paul has been helping me as both a, uh, with history and also with the French, as you mentioned, because I will put as a disclaimer, I don't speak French. Um, so, and if others here know about this book, have learned things about maybe you have it a copy in your collections, I'd be excited to hear about that as well. Okay, are we spotlighting the book? Uh, yes. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna dive right in. Um, this is a beautiful binding. Um, as we open it, wow. Okay, so many of the copies of this book have some kind of woven fly leaf, but it doesn't, it's usually not decorative like this. Um, and we very luckily have a provenance note that's telling us that this is given as a gift to, can we see that? Given as a gift um, in memory of this person's aunt. Um, really exciting. So this was actually, was this bought in Lyon, I think? As well, it was so. yeah we acquired this just recently uh in Lyon so um you know maybe it's, it's left Lyon for the first mm -hmm. time and it's in its history so as you probably know this book what's special about it is is that it is woven and not only woven but woven on a jacquard loom so the jacquard loom is really important in the history of technology it's often considered kind of uh, the, the forerunner to the modern computer because it's the first industrial era machine that uses punch cards. Why does this matter? Well, it basically means that now the art of weaving, the kind of practice of weaving can be taken off the weaver, the actual kind of doing of the weaving can be taken off of the weaver. And instead it's being done by punch cards. And I, if people are interested and wanna know more about this, you can put that in the chat. I'm happy to explain in more detail how the jacquard mechanism works. But a really key thing here is that it means that independent designers can make visual designs that can then be translated into punch cards that then can be woven. And there were lots of experiments with pictorial weaving throughout the 19th century. In England, you get stevenographs, which were done by uh, the firm Thomas Stevens. Um, in France, you get lots of kind of engraving style weavings done on jacquard looms that are specialty objects. And in fact, the weaver here, Joseph Alphonse Henri, he was responsible for earlier pictorial weavings. He was a, a, a key figure in Lyon in the, in the kind of, um, Lyon of course is a capital of silk weaving. He was a key figure in that capital. Um, he was mostly known for making church vestments, beautiful pictorial church, church vestments and church decorations woven in silk and gold. He had already won awards for it, but he was interested in actually weaving with text. And we know this because he did an experiment prior to this book in weaving in text. He wove a poem as a kind of broadside. Um, so this project he conceived around 1884, um, basically because he wanted to make, he wanted to kind of further this experiment and make a gift as part of the planned Jubilee in Lyon in 1886, I believe. And then there was going to be a, a Jubilee for the Pope in 1888. So he saw this kind of book of prayers, this medieval style book of prayers as an opportunity to make a gift um, and a kind of project for these events. 
So this book is entirely woven in silk. Um, there is 400 lines of thread per inch. Is that, yep. Um, 400 lines of thread per inch. And you can see as we go through this book, you're gonna see the detail. So I just wanna pause here um, briefly to point out this page. So maybe you've seen other copies. If, if there are people here from other libraries, sometimes this page has been, has some kind of kind of weaving in here to personalize it. Now we've learned that this book would have sold for 200 francs originally for an extra 80 francs, you could personalize this and people did. Um, so as, as late as 1902, and Matthew Westerby has done a lot of research on this. Thank you, uh, shout out to him. I've learned a lot from his work. Um, he's pointed out that as late as I believe 1902, you have kind of this as a wedding gift where somebody might say, you know, put the coat of arms of two families here and uh, give the book as a wedding gift. So we have here a book of prayers. Now, an important thing about this is that I mentioned before that the Jacquard loom um, part of what the Jacquard loom is doing is taking the, the process of designing off of the weaver, doing the designing kind of almost as they weave and putting it onto punch cards. How are those made? Well, you might hire someone, an artist, a designer to draw a designing that would be translated onto a grid. And then that grid would be translated into punch cards. So what we have here is the designer, Parvier, who was a Jesuit, um, was asked to make these designs. And what did he do? Well, he went to, um, I'm just gonna start kind of turning through so we can look at the detail of his designs. He went to, they were interested in making a book of prayers and he went to uh, a, a bunch of facsimiles that were floating around at the time of medieval manuscripts. Why were medieval manuscript facsimiles floating around? Well, we're in the, the 19th century. This book was made between 1884, 1886. And you have, lots of interest in chromolithography. This is an exciting new technology of reproduction. And you're starting to get different firms specializing in chromolithographic reproductions of medieval manuscripts, because that's a way of sharing the kind of boutique, uh, not boutique, but the specialty treasures of a library. So Herbier, he's trying to do these designs and he's going and he's looking at chromolithographic facsimiles in order to um, in order to make the designs. And you'll see that every page, um, it's very, it's kind of very beautifully done here. Every page has a <coughs> unique border and we have a couple kind of engravings um, that have been made. And Lillian Randall, who's an art historian and was a curator at the Walters um, for a time. And the Walters has a, a beautiful copy of this book and actually some other uh, things related to this book. Um, she's identified some of these patterns. Um, and part of what Paul and I have been doing with actually an undergraduate here, Laura Kim, is going and trying to kind of actually look at those chromolithographic facsimiles, go back to the medieval manuscripts and create a, a digital site that shows the different sources. Now, from what we've looked at, some of the designs, I will say they, you know, I was expecting them to copy the medieval manuscripts more precisely. That's not really true. It'll be little design features like this guy shows up, I remember in a manuscript, right? This little kind of patron prayer. Um, something else to point, about this, point out about this book. So it is woven. What does that mean? Well, each leaf is woven. So if we see here, um, Basically each leaf has been woven and then flipped around a piece of cardboard. So it goes from here over to here, flipped around a piece of cardboard. And then that cardboard stub is actually what's been bound in. So each leaf is kind of an independent, uh, <coughs> independent weaving. Whitney, do you know if the leaves are because it, 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 one imagines if it was just the silk it would be like super floppy and it wouldn't be able, you wouldn't really be mm -hmm. able to turn the pages in a, a you know, satisfactory way. Do you, do you think it's been adhered to the core or the paper or the cardboard core? Because it's really smooth and perfect. You don't get any sense of like something that's, and you think that if they had used glue or adhesive, it would discolor and stain the silk. It's, it's quite amazing how flawless it is. Oh, it re it really is, and actually, I think Paul and I were looking at a source recently that does it does say that it's glued, and I think in that source, 
um, we, we've been looking at contemporaneous um, kind of magazine articles about this thing. There was a lot of interest among French bibliophiles, um, Octave Uzan's Le Livre, this kind of famous French bibliophile magazine interested in book collecting and also technologies of the book, uh, book innovation. Um, there's an article that kind of describes it, but um, yeah, there we go, thank you. The pages are cut in pairs and the layout is as follows. On the left page is the recto side, on the verso is the right page. So that's what I was just describing. And then they would take a piece of cardboard and glue it. And sometimes it, it says in one of these things, right, you have to be really careful about the gluing because it would ruin, it would actually kind of ruin the book. Um, and given that we're talking about something that took, you know, I, I think um, Matthew in, in his uh, work on this says 100,000 cards, and that's based on some contemporaneous accounts. I've seen another estimate up to half a million cards. This could have taken, I mean, this was a, a lot of punch cards. And we're not talking about tiny little cards. These <laughs> jacquard punch cards are like pretty large, you know, like 14 by four inches, something around that. Yeah, great question. Um, look at the detail here though. I mean, it, I hope it's coming through on camera, but I will say that you do, this is a book you have to see in person um, for sure, because um, as we just, uh, uh, we just kind of attested when we looked at this copy and we're like, oh, we've been looking at these digital copies, but um, the silk is, is shiny, it's very fine, it's very beautiful. Um, and, and the weaving, I mean, it looks like ink, right? It looks really dark, um, kind of really, really um, silky dark, almost printing. It looks almost like a letter press. I mean, because yeah. there's a bit of relief. It's almost like the black silk is, you know, pushed into the, into the surface. Mm -hmm. and it's an amazing effect so that you can't quite get. Well, maybe you can get it from the, from the overhead. You can see here on this page, especially the kind of fine grained, almost like uh, better than an engraving, like really um, <coughs> detailed kind of gray. This is just with uh, light gray and black silk. Um, these effects are being produced. There's no other colors um, here. This is something unusual about looking at this actually. Um, you know, it's meant to imitate a medieval book of prayers, but of course a medieval book of prayers would be in color. So there's this kind of odd kind of effect, and this is why I, I often think of this as the first digital book. There's this kind of odd effect of a new technology being used to reproduce an old technology that comes through because of the materials and the substrate, right? Do we have some questions? Yeah, we have questions about um, color. That's one mm -hmm. I have too, I mean. Um, you know, presumably that would add like hugely to the complexity of of weaving a book like this, producing a book like this. But do we have any evidence of color? Or did they try to do anything in color? No, uh, not to my knowledge. I think that would have vastly complicated things. Um, and I will say, you know, some of the work that Paul and I have been doing, um, looking at these contemporary contemporaneous accounts. Um, I've been very interested in how was this book seen, right? So it was displayed at universal fa uh, fairs, kind of world's fairs. Um, this weaver had already won a prize at the 1878 Universal Exhibition in Paris for his weaving prior to doing this book. Um, so obviously he was kind of interested in <laughs> prize winning, award winning styles of work, right? So I think very much this was in line with, with with that vibe, right? It's, it's meant to be a book that wins prizes for its beauty. Um, but I also kind of have suspected that um, there's, a, there's a, just a tiny hint that this is a viable future for printing, just the tiniest little hint. Like what if we could weave books instead of printing them? You're at a moment in time when there's a lot of experimentation with printing technologies. You're getting a lot of new machines for automating typesetting. You're getting an explosion of chromolithography, chromolithographic printing. Um, and there's, there's this, just this kind of interest in new technologies of printing. You're getting new ways of printing photographs. Um, so just, a, and, and Octave Uzan, who was responsible for um, the magazine La Livre that printed um, some information about this, uh, that magazine is just full of, of kind of curiosity about like, what is the phonograph going to do to books? What are photographs going to do to books, right? Like just really interested in new technologies of the book. And the thought that you could weave a book 
um, must have been very fascinating, right? Because if you think about it, that really just puts the design work off onto the cards. Now, once you have a set of 100,000 cards, now that would take up a bunch of room in your shop. But once you have 100,000 cards, you could just keep weaving off copies, right? You could do more expensive copies in uh, more fine, fine silk. You could do kind of cruder copies at a lower resolution in thicker thread. Um, once you have the design set, it's, it's pretty easy to do. So some of what we've been seeing is that it's described as an experiment, as a research project, as a prototype. And someone even does say like, what if this was the future of printing? Um, which I, I just absolutely love. They very quickly say, oh no, probably not, right? But, but just the, the kind of little hints of it briefly is so tantalizing to me. Someone comments that, you know, weaving might, might be more sustainable and, and leave less of a carbon footprint than paper. I mean, totally. Well, paper is also made of cloth, right? I mean, so, so, I mean, at this time you're getting wood pulp paper and everything, but, but paper is made of cloth. So you're really cutting out the middleman by cutting out paper in some ways. I wonder if they were aware also of the degradation of some 19th century yeah. paper that was, you know, right. very, prone, very acidic and prone to disintegrating. <laughs> Oh yes, okay. Paul's pointing out to me some of the some of the things we've looked at. So um, the manufacturer had just invented. So I'm quoting from a contemporaneous source that's describing this book. Had just invented the woven book, which is to say, a book whose letters are inalterable, are indestructible, and whose material, because of its robustness, would be able to defy time. Right. So there's this idea, and I love that, that it's a medieval manuscript, right? So because there's this idea of parchment, of course, as being much more indestructible um, compared to the acidic papers that were beginning to be understood. Yeah. Someone says it's a lot of dead moth larvae. So <laughs> you think about it in those terms, you know, as we're, as we're getting used to thinking about manuscripts on parchment as in you know, kind of the, the bio codecology. It's interesting to think of, of this. Um, we have a question from Zach Lesser about is it a digital book in the sense that it was woven with a binary system of on, off, or up, down, or whatever for the loom? Binary computing incorporates a lot of error detection and correction. Was there some kind of error detection <laughs> involved in weaving this book? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, <coughs> yeah, so, I mean, there were definitely prototyping. In terms of error correction on the loom, I'm not sure. So but the loom is, like, entirely mechanical, right? Mm -hmm. There's no sort of... I mean, it's not, it's not electronic. I mean, it might've been run by electricity, but it's, it's, it's like a mechanical device. It's right? a mechanical device. So the, the Jacquard device is a thing that's put on top of a, of a typical loom and the punch cards, basically you might have 2000, uh, you know, threads here. And the punch cards are determining whether the heddles, which are like little, um, little almost like needles that lift up certain threads in order to pass the warp thread, lift up certain weft threads to pass the warp through. Um, the punch cards are definitely, I mean, they're binary, it's on off. Um, certainly this kind of history of weaving and textiles and computing continues. Um, jet card looms are still in, in use today in modified kind of electromechanical versions, of course. You have knitting machines that use punched cards. Um, and the punch card then went into being used for census tabulation in first in 1890 in America. So actually around the same time as this book was being experimented with. Um, and, and after that, the census tabulating company invented by or founded by Herman Hollerith became IBM. Um, IBM punch cards became the standard for early computing. And Nick was pointing out there's a nice kind of resonance with this book being at Penn since the ENIAC machine, which has claim on being one of the first um, computers is here and there's still pieces of it that can be seen in the, the engineering department. But just, just to be clear, like these the punch cards in the loom, I mean, they're not, it's not a computer program in the sense of, I mean, each, each hole in the punch card represents like whether we can't really call it a pixel, but whether whether something is black silk or white silk, yeah. right? There's no sort of language. I mean, it, it's it's a very simple language of computing in a sense. It's not like a, <coughs> it's not like a complex program in the sense of many different options or something that's computed per se, right? That is true. Although I will say that that I think it's what's 
what's important is this kind of shift towards the relationship between software and hardware. Like mm -hmm. before you just kind of have hardware that a person manipulates directly. And once you get the Jacquard Loom, you get software that can kind of run independently. So I can give you my punch cards. I'm a weaver in the on. I can give you my punch card. You can run it on your machine, right? right. And without necessarily being able to discern what the pattern is. Right. Looking at the punch right. You don't have to know mean? anything about it. And right. so then weaving actually becomes manual labor, which becomes, um, oops, sorry for bumping that, everyone, um, which becomes devalued. Um, but then the, the, the process of design becomes much more valued, right? Like if you're able to, um, if you're able to design a pattern and transfer it into, um, the grid and then, and then the, the kind of devalued labor is punching out the grid, which becomes feminized labor, um, and actually doing the weaving, which also then becomes feminized labor because it's manual. It's not thought to require any kind of, um, intellectual contribution, which of course feeds right into at this moment in time, women who are tabulators are called computers. <coughs> uh, that's part of this history as well. That term was originally applied to mostly women who are doing calculations um, and tabulation using these kind of early punch card machines. We have a question about, um, or comment, I'm not sure about the Lyon context, but I know in the late 19th, early 20th century America, in America, most of the raw silk was imported from Japan, but actually, we do we know about a little bit about this, right? Um, all yes. about the origin of the silk. Yeah, they were they were very proud about the fact that the silk was from uh, the Sudan region in France, which was uh, which had the, the reputation of providing the finest silk uh, in Europe. Um, so they were very proud about that. So, so there, there's a kind of I'm chauvinist not, or a exactly, kind of nationalist. I'm not sure uh, whether aspect. it was, you know, in reaction to other sourcing, uh, that I'm not sure. But uh, what we've seen in the archives is uh, them being very proud about this quality of silk from France, from that region. Um, Eugene Hissou uh, asked, is the punch card basically a stencil? Or did it have an intermediary language that communicated the commands to the loom? Good question. Um, I wouldn't use the <laughs> word stencil, but it's basically, it is the intermediary thing that is providing the commands to the loom in the sense that the heddle will either lift or not lift based on whether there's a hole or not a hole there. So this is, um, to Zach's point, like this is the, the origins of the binary system. There's, we can find binary systems at ever, like around the globe at most periods in time, um, but like systems that utilize some form of on off. But the important thing here is that we have that on off information being stored in a substrate, right? So it's being stored in this heavy card stock punch card. And because it's being stored kind of externally, it, that, that mechanism can communicate to the loom how to weave so now like again you don't the weaver doesn't have to know anything at all right they just they just pass the warp threads back and forth i was in leon this summer and got to see a demonstration of a 19th century jacquard loom and it's it's very noisy but um it works right the cards just chug on through and you you use a pedal actually to pass the warp th warp threads through no electricity um and you can really plow through weaving the the work here like look at this the work here <laughs> is in this extraordinary design and it's transfer into grid paper and then that grid papers transfer into the punch cards once you do that you can just kind of um, plow right through actually weaving this thing and is it important in the sense of you know that the end product is something uh, visually intelligible to humans right i mean it's um I mean, Morse code is a system where things are encoded, but you know the, the code itself has to be decoded sort of by humans. Whereas, right. I mean, That's the end product point. here, I mean, stuff be decoded by our eyes and our brains or, or whatever, but I mean, it's something <laughs> that, is, that is actually kind of recognizable an image and text um, that doesn't need sort of translation once it's been pro you know, produced on the loop. Right, that's a great point. And this idea of human readable, it's a machine readable thing, the punch card, right? Like that's, I think that's the, uh, another part of this kind of shift towards software, shift towards information, um, it being materialized. It's a machine readable thing. Uh, we have a question, <laughs> a lot of intense questions in the chat. <laughs> Leah, Leah Price asks, how does storage function uh, the storage function, which Zach had mentioned, 
compared to stereotype mm -hmm. plates? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so stereotype plates could be used to to make copies, certainly. Um, and there is a there's that's a really nice connection that I like here. Um, thank you, Leah, for that. Um, to another kind of 19th century means of copying a book, like once you make a stereotype plate, you can kind of hold it indefinitely and kind of print off a copy whenever whenever you'd like. Um, and I would say also the stereotype plate shares with this the fact that there's kind of baked into the plate um, the the actual design already, right? So you're not like you can't really like switch out type. I mean, I guess you can kind of chip off things, and but it's not easy, right? And it's the same here. You can't really like switch out things once it's set. It's kind of, you know, set in stone in a way. Um, but I would say that that's a little bit different because the, the punch card, just back to this point, we keep kind of cycling around. It's really, um, it's a machine readable thing, right? The stereotype plate is still in some sense just reproducing the same relief technology. And this is this is something that's um, wholly different in the process by which it's being made. I'll point out, I know we have a few, just a few more minutes here, but since I'm on this last page, how lovely and medieval this is, this is the kind of colophon where we get information about the designer, um, Hervier, who was a Jesuit, who is only responsible so far as has been discovered um, for one other set of engravings of shells. He was interested in shells as well, um, but otherwise this was this was his work. Um, Henri, the, the weaver, and then he partnered with a bookseller to sell these books. So we didn't mention it, but um, these are, you can buy it for 200 francs. You can get it bound for between 100 and 1,000 francs. Um, and you can have it customized, as I said before, for about 80 francs. And some of the bindings on these are really um, beautiful, but you could have just bought it in uh, as a leaf. And in fact, the Walters has a, an unbound leaf of this. That's just kind of the woven silk itself. And it's worth maybe just mentioning this. So this is the table of contents as well at the end. And, you know, for, for such um, a, uh, you know, book, that, a book that's so extraordinary on the, from, from a technology point of view, mm -hmm. I mean, it has the most sort of um, kind of conservative, traditional, uh, you know, kind of Catholic, oh, yes. uh, French Catholic sort of uh, contents. I mean, it's standard prayers, a mass oh, for a uh, wedding, mm -hmm. uh, different sort of um, evening prayers, very That's kind right. of simple, kind right. of standard. And, you know, part of That's this, right. I think, is also, uh, as, this, uh, as Whitney was saying, this is, you know, the history of vestments, right, of like, mm -hmm. um, uh, fabrics used in uh, church services, you know, is, is kind of closely bound up with this. And there's a, it's kind of a moment also of like Catholic revival mm -hmm. in France, um, I guess after after the Second Empire. So you have this kind of, you know, the kind of ideology behind it is interesting for something that's so, I mean, it's very quite conservative or sort of almost neoconservative from a religious standpoint, <laughs> yeah. but then you have this kind of really cutting edge technology in a sense. Um, we're still, so people are still wondering about the glue used for the silk. The glue, yeah, I see some questions about editing. I don't know exactly the glue. Um, to everyone's kind of concern about it, it must have been, um, uh, it definitely had to have been, and like I said, in the contemporaneous sources they describe, you can easily ruin a, a leaf. Um, it had to have been non-acidic. Non it must have been some kind of, um, they must have done some research into that as well. Um, to this point about editing, I just wanted to go back to this page. Um, like Zach's pointing out, like, wouldn't it be easy to edit the punch cards? In some ways it would, right? Like here you have a frame that somebody could make, you could make a new design and just kind of add it into the frame. Um, so, and, and that's, that's kind of interesting, the ability to customize this book. But presumably, I mean, it would be very difficult to do sort of manually because you've yeah. got like thousands of lines of right. silk and you've got to kind of figure out the one that has a problem. Right. And then sort of find the, I mean, it, it, it it's about seems as, like it would yeah. be really daunting as a process. About as viable as like editing a stereotype plate in some ways, right? So, I mean, it's, you know, it's it's doable though, for sure. All right, well, it's 1230. Uh, so that was short, but sweet, but um, uh, we look forward to, you know, learning more as your project, uh, Whitney and Paul, and, and you know, continues. And um, uh, we, we have photographed them. Item and beautiful photographs of this and available. it will be online uh, i think within a matter of a few months with the photographs mm -hmm. yeah. thank you everyone mm -hmm.